This conference will now be recorded. Over 30 years of experience working on the asset management, design, construction and management of civil and system facilities for light, heavy and commuter rail transit projects, both in the United Kingdom and in the United States. Mona's experience includes national asset management of railway drainage and line side design and construction management of track, signalling and communications works, and also the procurement and installation, including new and novel technology, processes and systems development and training, including apprenticeship, assurance and compliance, IT application development. Mona is also a budget hold, has budget holder responsibilities and is skilled in people management. So before I hand over to Mona, can I just ask everyone to keep your uh, microphones off and cameras off, please, during the presentation, and then we'll have an opportunity to turn them on at the end. If you do have any questions, please use the um, message box uh, to type questions, and then we'll, we'll field the questions at the end of the presentation. So it's my pleasure to introduce Mona. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Liam. And thank you everyone from PWI for allowing me to come tonight and speak to you. I, uh, I do wish we were doing this more in person. Um, there's a few names I've seen just pop up on the on the uh, participants that I recognize and it would have been lovely to to say hello to you uh, face to face, but uh, never mind. It's a new it's a new world. Uh, so as as Liam's mentioned, if you could hold questions to the end, um, I promise I will not talk for the whole hour, even though those that do know me know that I could talk about drainage all day long. Uh, so I am the network technical head, aka previously known as the professional head for drainage and line side. So I look after the green estate and I also look after boundaries, um, access facilities and walkways. I affectionately refer to drainage and line side as the blue, green, gray infrastructure. And for those who are aware of what's happening in the world of sustainability and, and, and well, what we're trying to do in this space, uh, the blue, green, gray infrastructure is, 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 is trending and catching a lot of interest. Um, so today I wanted to speak to you about drainage. Uh, specifically about drainage, drainage performance, and drainage role within the railway system. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, Carmont and some of the findings there. Although the RAPE Carmont review is not yet published, um, there is some findings, and there was an independent task force that also was undertaken, which found uh, made some recommendations just 55, um, and I'll share those. Uh, well, I'll share a few of those. I will not share all 55. So um, without further ado, let me go ahead and click. I'm hoping that I'm seeing what you're seeing. Way hey, okay. So drainage is a system. What am, what am I talking about? Um, drainage is a is a link node relationship. It, it is a, is a, is a um, they are connected assets that act for the primary purpose to collect and convey water from multiple points of entry to a point of exit, uh, the discharge point. And why, why are we doing that? Drainage is collecting and conveying the water to enable the railway assets to perform in an optimum manner. And that's the railway system, all railway assets. We're talking about track, signaling, earthworks, um, tunnels, the, you name it, um, there's a role there of drainage to collect and convey that water to, to provide that strong backbone, that dry formation and foundation upon which we are building and running our railway. Um, and so for that reason, drainage um, previously referred to as a child asset, I would argue is not the child asset, actually. I think it's the parent asset. And a lot of the other assets are there uh, because they support, uh, they are supported by a functioning drainage system. Um, and what I mean by that is often, often it's saying, you know, we've got track and then drainage is a child asset. We've got earthworks and then earth um, drainage is a child asset. Uh, drainage doesn't care. Water flow doesn't care about our boundaries. It doesn't care about the assets. It's it's following a flow that is natural to it, which is down stream it flows downhill and it follows the path of least resistance that path could be through our um, cable troughing that path could be well 
through the ballast or up and over the ballast. Um, and you have enough flow and enough of an energy that 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 water flow will take some of those assets with it. Um, we've we've had a recent incident in um, a washout where river a river overtopping has taken the ballast out with it, and that's not unusual. So so we're trying to manage water. Water will always win, and nature will always win. So for us, it's about looking at that flow and managing that flow in a way that it is collected and conveyed to allow our other railway assets to perform to their best optimum performance. I'm, I'm a civil engineer by background. Um, civil uh, water, water is the enemy of all civil engineers. Uh, you need to have a dry, dewatered area to, to, do, to build, to maintain. And for that reason, um, drainage and water management is quite key. Currently, our drainage, our drainage system is it's old. It's a legacy system. We uh, don't know where all of our assets are. Or we are frantically working to identify where those assets are, geospatially tag where those assets are, and map those um, onto our system. So we're, we are able then to model performance and, and surface runoff against those systems, drainage systems. Normal times that drainage system is tested. Under normal weather conditions, that drainage system is tested. But we currently are experiencing extreme and adverse weather, and we've got climate change. Um, climate change isn't something of the future. Climate change is now. And the challenges that we face with climate change and the extreme and adverse weather, be that convection, um, frontal rainfall or convective rainfall, um, being able to predict the amount of rainfall and where it's going to land um, adds an additional challenge onto these aging legacy assets. So we've got more to do in order to understand uh, the asset management and performance of the drainage system in a way that it can perform to its optimum manner. Another thing that tests the drainage performance is land use and land use changes. And we are forever, uh, we network rail and the railway system as a whole are forever uh, trying to manage what we call imported risk from third parties. Uh, I, I do kind of laugh at that uh, because we talk about when the farmer's field floods the railway or when there was a construction site near the railway that, that brought a risk onto us, um, be it silt or a different change in flow or an increase in flow of the, of the surface runoff uh, from the adjacent land. Um, but you know what, our water goes somewhere too, and, and we have neighbors on both sides, so the railway also contribute to water discharging in, onto people's, into people's homes, um, also have affect uh, farmers where we flooded their fields and they've lost their, their crop, um, and we've, we've damaged their property. So um, we're not a victim of surface water runoff. We also contribute to surface water runoff uh, to our line side neighbors. And so uh, the additional challenge around drainage is to ensure that we collect and convey water coming towards us, but that we also collect and convey it in a way that is uh, friendly to our line side neighbors and is compliant to environmental legislation when we discharge that water into river courses, et cetera. So it sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? What's what's the problem? Um, <laughs> just let's get on with doing it. Connect connect the drainage system, see it as a flow, points of entry to point of exit, voila. Um, we've got, we <laughs> we look at drainage in piecemeal. We, we break it up into different pieces and we not only do we renew it in these pieces, we also maintain it in these pieces. Um, be that we look at earthworks drainage separate to track drainage and how do the two meet? Well, that's not, you know, who does that? Um, we look at tunnel drainage as, as separate to the track drainage. Oh, that's them over there. That's not to do with us. And so what ends up happening is that, um, what, what ends up happening is that we, we break the system. We don't look at the complete flow. We don't look at how the, the water is actually meant to, to flow through our infrastructure. And by piecemealing it, we might think, great, I've done my 400 yards of drainage uh, renewal in the track. However, where's the water going to? Where's the water coming from? Have we actually looked at that? And, and on top of that, is it actually resilient? Have we built in the capacity 
in that system or are we just looking at the one part that we're looking at and going this is happy days but actually what we need to do is build actually more resilience into the whole drainage system uh, when i when i refer to resilience i'm talking about uh, the cabinet office's definition of resilience which includes recovery rate redundancy reliability um, and oh gosh i forgot what the fourth r is it, there's another four r it'll come to me in a second i'll say it in a second so the drainage system must be resilient to to meeting its current demand as well as future future climate change projections and we need to look at it as a system flowing through um, the, the, the railway, not just uh, a track and tunneling and earthworks. And we, we have a lot of own goals um, when we don't do it that way. We, we fixed earthworks drainage and then end up flooding the track. We fixed the track drainage and then end up ha um, having a, an embankment washout. Uh, we we fix one part and then the water starts to flow. We we create a problem downstream, literally downstream. So so we need to start really thinking about that flow throughout um, the 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 drainage system and what our role is in different parts of the organization. Be that the structures from culverts and tunnels to track and the ballast I include as part of the drainage system here. What's going through the ballast? down to the, the pipe and pit system, to um, what's coming off of the crest drains, down our slopes, down the embankments, until eventually we get to the outfall, the one point, the last point of the system. Um, so that that's the drainage system that sits all by itself, that little um, uh, alone. Uh, when you think about, I'll, I'll mention this in a second, I'll talk about that. So you've got, um, You've got drainage that sits within the railway system. And what is the railway system? The railway system is very, lots of different assets. And the railway system itself is, is quite complex and has lots of interdependencies and interrelationships between um, different asset groups. And so when you've got um, a thread that's following through, aka water flow, what you've got is when we don't consider it holistically, when we don't consider drainage and drainage performance holistically, there is a negative, there can be a negative impact on other assets. So earthworks, we talk about uh, landslips or washouts, uh, track in S&C, we talk about washouts, we talk about wet beds, we could talk about some track geometry faults, twist faults, cyclic top. Um, we can, Gosh, we're spending loads of money putting in lovely SNC schemes. Um, and if it's on wet ground, you're just not going to have this, the track stiffness you need there for 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 um, that 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 SNC unit or that track to perform to its optimum manner. Uh, structures and tunneling themselves. We've got scour. Um, we've got uh, tunnel. Gosh, tunnel drainage. Don't you just love tunnel drainage? Ah. The, the the most complex and the most simple of all things um, and how wet our tunnels are generally what is that doing to it their stability to to the walls and um, around the, the the track to the hydrostatic pressure that's within the tunnel and the lighting and the earthwork that sits on top of it if we're not getting that water away um, signalings and telecom well uh, we're talking about that I always I joke, uh, but it, there's a there's a unfortunately there's a truth in my joking that when water doesn't find a nice flow, it will find its own flow, and often it's the cable troughing. It's a lovely little drainage system, secondary drainage system that's there if we don't do this right. Um, so so you've got that you've got track circuit failures, the number of track circuit failures when we flood the 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 railway, um, and how how expensive and the cost and performance impact of those track circuit failures due to water is, is quite high. Uh, they're a small number, but the cost is quite high. Um, electrification, uh, gosh, you know, electricity and water do not like each other. We've got, we've got third rail, we've got substations. Um, unfortunately, we've hurt people who have, uh, who are, who have, who've gone into electrical buildings even though there's steam coming out of them, uh, that's water. Is that drainage? Mm, could be, could be. I'll get to that in a second. Is it drainage or is it just a lot of water? Um, wet buildings, as we call them now, wet buildings. Um, stations and operational property are oh, the joy. Uh, so 
when I talk about drainage, I'm not talking about water that's used for human consumption. So I'm not talking about the sinks, the, the drinking water, the, the toilets, the showers, etc. Uh, nor am I talking about any of the drainage that is in stations operational property. However, the railway drainage that I'm referring to does absolutely have a connection to stations and operational property. We have car parts that discharge water straight onto the track. We have uh, depots that discharge sewage straight onto the track. We have stations that are flooded when we have um, high street environment flooding or when the railway itself has a lot of flooding and there's lots of pumps coming out to support the, those those areas so so it's all about the flow of water and drainage um, and of course train operations uh, flooding incidents the number of flood delay minutes um, the amount of um, erosion it does uh, you, you can't see so you've got to put speed restrictions on um, all, all of these are are quite significant when you start to look at the bigger picture and put all that together um, rather than just drainage system performance. Now you're talking about railway system performance where water, rainfall, um, water management, poor drainage is impacting other assets in that railway system and what it costs. Um, post Carmont, um, one of the works uh, that we did was to go back through previous incidents and start to do a bit of a forensic review of, pre of previous um, major incidents. So we what we did was we specifically looked at RABE reports uh, that are published. Um, and when we were looking at those RABE reports, we went, there, there is a 1940 report. It wasn't RABE, uh, but there was an incident in 1940 that was Watford. Uh, Watford derailment, uh, Watford soil, soil uh, rock cutting washout that then caused a derailment and the drainage system was put in at that time and then corporate knowledge unfortunately was lost, the knowledge of the local area was lost um, and everybody forgot what it was and the asset was actually recorded as a retaining wall. Um, and so when we had another incident at the same place in 2016, um, which led to two train, two passenger train derailing, clipping each other, and almost having the most catastrophic, horrific incident that could have been. When you talk about being lucky, um, you know think, uh, that that Watford incident to me was quite frightening uh, because of what it could have been. Um, two pa two full on pre COVID packed trains, passenger trains going towards London, just coming out of London, at, in a cutting, at a tunnel, um, quite a long tunnel, a mile, I think it's a mile long tunnel, could have been really, really bad when you think about emergency services, et cetera. So, so thank goodness that that didn't happen at Watford, but did we learn? Did we learn the lessons from that and were we aware of what we needed to do? Two years after Watford, we had Corby, um, and the, the, the Corby landslip and the impact that that had on passengers as well and passenger trains and the deboarding of passengers and what we learned in that space. So surely we must be getting better. Um, uh, sorry, I shouldn't have shown you the slide. I sh showed you the slide and then I've said, surely we must be getting better. So the, the slide to be uh, that I've sh that's up at the, um, up at the moment looks at published rape reports um, and there's a couple of ORR reports. These by all means are not all the drainage incidents. There are major incidents that ORR have reported. There are other incidents that we have reported within the business and investigated, sorry, investigated within the business. These are rave, these are the big ones. And when you look at how many they are, we, I think I go back to 2005. So I didn't put the two, 1940 ones, but the 2005, when we look at those reports and you look at the recommendations that come out of those reports and we categorized and grouped those recommendations, changes to third party land, poor data management, a uh, lack of awareness of drainage as a system. Oh, hey, somebody else was saying it, competency, um, no long-term plans, uh, poor fish inefficient processes, um, previous corrective actions not implemented on one. And you start to look at the, 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 
uh, impact that that has and then what did that create that created a flood incident that created um a poor design or poor maintenance and then what did that create um what happened then what happened then um you start to see um, a clustering of some of those recommendations and you start to see where there's an actual a grouping of them drainage asset not performing or capacity exceeded is the threat but what caused that increased drainage runoff is one thing that caused that but you also have competencies design maintenance uh not it, incorrect assessment of the flood risk and i would probably add now incorrect assessment of surface water runoff as well is is a new is something that we're like mm, not very good at so so are we learning are we getting better or are we repeating the the unfortunately the mistakes of the past um i think i think we're not learning yet we're not learning yet um but we are definitely talking about drainage uh, in the business and we are a lot of people are uh, so, so are other railway industry operators, and so are designers um, and contractors. Um, and we are trying to be a bit better based on post Carmont what had happened. Um, but there's still more to do. There's there's definitely still more to do. Uh, we've had Carmont was August 2020, and 14 months later we had almost the exact similar incident happen in Southern but we didn't derail the train and that was only because we had a temporary speed restriction on due to the extreme and adverse weather. So the train was traveling at 40 miles an hour and was able to stop before hitting the washout. But when you, when you looked at the sequence of events and the findings of that incident to Carmont, there was a lot, um, a lot of similarities, a lot of similarities. So are we learning? So my challenge to this lovely community is, are we learning, are we getting better? Um, and are, are we are we actively asking the right questions for us to, to be a learning organization and to, and to learn from the past and not repeat those mistakes of the past? So a couple of things that we are doing in this space to to start to be better and things that we are thinking about how are we going to be better in this space is um, looking at that surface water runoff. So I said drainage is a system. It's links and nodes that are connected. They're they're all connected and they sit in the railway system. But of course the railway system sits on in, within the UK on planet Earth. So so we have to start to really look at what is happening outside of our fences, what is happening on the other side of our boundaries. Um, and one of those things is is catchment catchment analysis and calculating the amount of surface water runoff that is coming towards the railway. It sounds it sounds like, why have we never done this before? We do on some designs, but not everywhere. Um, and not only, and, but we do it with a view of designing for drainage. However, I would challenge you to say, surely all asset groups would want to know if the area that their assets are currently located have a high threat level of surface water runoff or a high um, a threat of water coming towards them with a high energy um, level. So volume of water, but then also the flow and energy of that water coming towards them. And if we were able to map that out, would all assets not be quite interested to know where their assets are and where the work are, that that catchment is going to ch channel and convey a lot of water towards them? Um, and then you could ask, well, do we have drainage in place and is it working? But you could also start looking at some other things. You could start to say, what can we put our electrification assets somewhere else? Maybe we're putting in a new substation. Let's not put it in the red area. Let's maybe put it in a green or amber area if we can. Um, if we can't, then we need to think about SUDS, sustainable um, drainage systems. We need to think about how we're going to get that water away, how we're going to keep that building um, dry. Um, we need to think about what the impact of that surface water runoff is to our track geometry and track quality. We need to think about that surface water runoff to, of course, landslips. Um, but, but the positive side is you could start to look at habitat and biodiversity. You could start to look at where you where water and the green estate can work together. So we start we can start to look at blue green gray infrastructure and there's lots in this space that's going on around um, the use of natural flood management 
uh, in New York, I think, is you got leaky dams. There's a project in the eastern region of of network rail that are, are actually using berms and dams but making them leaky dams so that when the water so the water building up building up it seeps through so it's a different it's that soak away resilience it's that recovery allowing it to have an over um, a spillage area where it's held and then it slowly dissipates rather than a massive flow of water coming through there's other things where working with the environment agency we're looking at planting trees on third party land outside of network rail where you're planting trees you're planting vegetation and using that green estate to to either absorb or divert or slow down the amount of water that's coming towards the railway and that's the, that's the sort of thinking we need to start looking at when you look at sustainability and trying to have a low carb solution uh, solu low carbon, <laughs> I need to diet, but that's a different carb, uh, a low carbon solution about what we're putting into the ground. Um, there's a lot of other things around the understanding the impact of that adjacent land use. So where you've got um, farmers fields, it's, it's, it's speaking to the farmers fields. Now we're not talking about changing agricultural um, practices that are thousands of years old about tilling the land in different ways and using different of course, we're not going to do that. Who are we, Big Bad Network Rail, to come and say that? However, when working with a farmer, and if they were, if they, if we can understand their patterns and what they're doing, and that they are going to till their land and have the plows now 90 degrees to the track, and we are aware of that, we can then start to look out for the impact of that onto our drainage system, and start to look at better coping with that. And it's win-win for for both parties. Um, Ultimately, I keep saying we, and there's a lot of we and we in the, in the space as well. Um, a lot of a lot of what we do comes down to people, and it's it's it is really our people that will make things happen. Um, the when when Carmont happened, the the executive leadership team commissioned an external uh, specialist to do a review of earthworks management, which then led into drainage management as well. And I mentioned there was 55 recommendations. And when I start to look at those recommendations and I started to group them, especially those that, that live in my area, my space of drainage and line side, there were some really key ones that I thought really said something. And they talk about our people, about sufficient and competent people, about dedicated drainage maintenance teams, about increasing the resources um, of drainage engineers' competencies uh, when it comes to looking at water asset management or water management as a whole, um, and to as a priority for Network Rail to address the lack of competence and resources. And we are doing a lot in this space. We are we are building a um, a training curriculum program that will support the drainage and line side community about understanding what it is that they're looking for. It seems it seems basic, but we we don't don't assume what we think is common sense or basic is not. Um, there's been examples of where we've gone out and the engineers on my team have said they've gone out with maintenance and they're responding to a flood incident. And we're looking at the flood location, putting in pumps and so forth there. And no one's thought to go, hang on, why don't we just walk downstream? Maybe there's a trash screen that's blocked, or maybe there's the water's not able to get to the discharge point. Or maybe we need to look upstream, what's added this additional work. So where the flooding is, is often not where the problem is. It's upstream or downstream that you need to look at. Um, sounds basic, but, but it's about competency. It's about making people who are unconsciously incompetent turning that into consciously incompetent and then competent through a training program that's delivered through a variety of ways through multiple media not all classroom based but through multiple ways so there's a lot of uh, focus that i'm putting on the people side of it and the reason i believe the people are the key thing that we need to look at is is um a, a while ago um, when I was uh, a long, long time ago, <laughs> uh, I am old, <laughs> when I was in, in track, um, I remember one of our directors talking about people, processes and technology. And the analogy they made is that you have a beautiful piano 
um, you know, the best tuned, absolutely beautiful piano sitting on a stage in a lovely orchestra. You've got the best piece of music ever written. The music sheet is there. That nothing will happen without somebody being able, one, to know how to play the piano and to read the music. So there's a competence in the, the, the systems and the process, but it's the people, it's the people. And that, that's the most important part because you can make great music without that sheet of music and that piano but it's the people without the people it won't happen you won't get um everything to work so don't you know and i, I think about that very often about oh, trying to write a standard if it sits on a shelf or trying to write create tools that nobody uses it's it, it's for naught so um there's 18 recommendations specifically aligned to the off-track drainage and line side accountability sorry and these are the uh, lord mayor apologies lord robert mayor was the um um the 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 main person who was leading the task force and he brought a team together and wrote a very large report a very very academic type report i kid you not over 400 pages um of which had 55 recommendations and when i sift through them 18 of those recommendations land in my area and I mentioned there was some that were specifically around people, but there was also around those that are around technology and process. And so there are current, I currently have 11 work streams pulling together uh, the projects that we need to do um, to deliver this. But the biggest challenge and the biggest recommendation I have is about creating a culture change within, within the business. I mean, goodness me, why did I, how do you do that? Um, and how you do it is with people. And how, that's how you do it. And and it's about it's about competency. It's about recognizing and caring for those people. It's about supporting them and making them feel valued that what they're doing is important. That the blue, green, gray is important. And it's not secondary. It's not a child. It's not a byproduct. It's not. Oh, you're not the railway. Um, if you're not tracking signals, you're not the railway. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the blue, green, gray is just as important. And and if anything, climate change, extreme and adverse weather, current social feelings around biodiversity and habitat all mean that network rail needs to step up and we need to be bold and start to really focus on what we need to do in the space. And um, last slide, promise, uh, is, is water. Isn't it gorgeous? It's glorious and it's treacherous. Uh, I, I promise you, if you don't have a glass of water now or a bottle of water nearby, you are thirsty. We as humans, we need water. We live on the blue planet. It's not going anywhere. There's the lovely water cycle. Why are we surprised when we have events of flooding? Why, why does this catch us out? And of course, it, well, it catches us out probably because climate change is here. It is now. And we're having these, these strange weather events that are catching us off guard. But um, risk, risk is, both threat, is both threat and opportunity. Often we look at risk and only think about the threat, but risk is threat and opportunity. It's the flip side of the coin. And so there are pictures of some of the threats that are created when poor drainage or lots of water are flooding. Um, oh, and by the way, sorry, that top uh, right-hand photograph is in Leeds. There is a river on the other side. Um, that's the River Kirkstall that's over tipped. And uh, there is a railway there because if you look at the top, you could just see the OLE there. So it's, it's one of my favorite pictures for the wrong reasons. Um, but, you know, water, water is its own force and we're not going to stop it. We're not going to, we're not going to win. Water will win. Lovely Grand Canyon, you know, water is going to win. So it's about managing it, managing the control of it and the flow of it so that it doesn't impact us. And sometimes it's about collecting that water and using it in a different way and directing it to someone who does want it and who says, look, you might have a lot of flooding in this area, but in summertime, we need that water. So we want to collect it and use it in, in suds or we want to collect it and put it as, as a balancing pond because actually there's a positive social impact about having those spaces. Um, and so it's for us to start thinking bigger and broader um and the challenges are here they're here now and so um i look forward to us being better 
as a community, not just network rail, but as, as a bigger, wider community, as a railway community, for us being better and, and addressing these challenges and opportunities with innovation, uh, with social responsibility, with sustainability, and with safety and performance, um, first and foremost, as well. So thank you very much for allowing me to just carry on and on. Um, I'll now open the floor to questions. I saw there's some things coming up in the chat, but um, I could take a look at some of those chats if that helps out or Liam, how does it work? <laughs> Great, thank you, Mona. Mm -hmm. um, so usually I would just uh, go through the questions and invite people to unmute the microphone or put the webcam on if they want and, and ask you directly, or if not, I'll, I'll read them out. So the first question was from uh, Leventi Noggi. Uh, I know Leventi, go on. <laughs> Hello, can you Leventi. hear me now? Yes. Hi, so, so, sorry about that. It wasn't, uh, wasn't an actual question. I was just simply emphasizing and confirming everything that uh, Mona was saying. Uh, we, we generally, as, uh, as civil engineers, track engineers, we, we, we tend not to appreciate uh, the importance of, uh, of the drainage, but uh, things, things are changing. So uh, we, with people like Mona who are, uh, who, who are uh, preaching all this almost on a daily basis, and uh, I dare to say even uh, us in the track bed team uh, uh, and uh, preaching the drainage uh, every day in our TBI report. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty confident that thing, things are changing and uh, uh, our colleagues from, uh, from the earthworks and from the track uh, engineering community will look at drainage in the future in, uh, with a different eye and I'm sure they, they've already started. Yeah, they have, Levante. I absolutely agree. <laughs> and good, good to see you, Mona, again. Uh, the very, very great, great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's not fair. It's I know Levante, fair. so he can say that. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, so Richard Hill, it's probably a comment again rather than a question, but, but I don't know if Richard wanted to explain anything about his problem at Clay Cross. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to turn my mic on. I'll introduce myself. I'm Richard Hill. I work for the Network Rails Asset Protection Team in Derby. Um, yeah, we had a very similar problem to what uh, Mona was discussing with the leaky dams and stuff like uh, cutting at Clay Cross where we've had a few flooding issues. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to, what's been tried is leaky dams. But again, it comes back to the common sense. Nobody actually walked up screen to find out it was a housing developer discharging into a ditch drainage, which was then flooding our track from three quarters of a mile away. So it wasn't until me and the TMA had a walk up stream to find out what was causing the problem that we discovered a new housing estate we didn't know about. So, uh, yeah. but it was, again, the way it's being dealt with is vegetation planting and stuff like that. Um, in adjacent land to try and take and slow the flow down so we actually slow it down so it's not hitting the railway as, as fast and stuff like that but it is into a cutting a, a tunnel portal so it could have been quite nasty um again so yeah it does happen yeah. so thanks for thanks for mentioning it so yeah richard absolutely absolutely my heart goes out to Asper as well they've got massive challenge there and we've been talking about working with town planning so that when there is there is housing development, except for we could start to ask the right questions or at least start to point uh, that those sorts of developments to the right place. Because you're big housing developers, you know, you get it early enough, they're uh, totally fine. They'll be like, yeah, sure, we could do this, we could do that, because I guess, you know, it's the homeowners that are going to pay for it. Um, but sometimes it's the smaller ones, it's the farmers' fields, et cetera, that caught, caught us unawares as well. Um, Watford was a, was third party, you know, they did what they did was absolutely allowed uh, to be done on their land. Uh, change the water flow and the and the uh, intensity of it, and we were caught we were caught out at, at a tunnel portal location. So it, it's it's massive, it's massive. Yes, what you said there is very important because I was discussing with the town and country planning people that when they come to put the planning applications in, maybe they should be getting the involvement from asset yeah. protection at a lot earlier stage. Yes. So we're looking at whether that when the planning de development goes out, we actually send out the IEQ. To them straight away so they actually get yeah. the guidance notes before they do it 
so yeah, it, it, puts, yeah. it gives us more time to deal with it so absolutely uh, unfortunately we're not we're not a statutory advisor um we're not they don't uh, they don't have to tell us if if no, they're they i think it's at five meters or something so we were yeah. trying to see if we could change that as well but we are also looking at uh, technology around uh, land use, uh, land change detection using satellite imagery to see whether we can pick up stuff that we maybe haven't found out about through planning, but it does change the flow of water coming towards us. That's been a very difficult conversation, and uh, not just with drainage, with ASPRO, is yeah. we can't lease our neighbours, but we only find out what they're doing when we've done it, and then we have to deal with yeah. it afterwards. That's the, yeah. The big Richard issue. T Tony Gomez is on the project with us, so he's got we've yeah. got Aspera in the team, so we're, yeah. we'll okay. hope to get something soon. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thank you, um, Joan. Here was next with a question. Yes, I did. Hi, Mona. Thank you very much Hi, for that Joan. presentation. That was great. Okay. That was really, really good. Thank you. My, My question, Mona, is about you were talking in your presentation about the sort of com compartmentalization if you like of approach yeah. within network rail where you've got like earthworks people and track people yeah and a lot in my experience a lot of that type of behavior is driven in the way the control period settlement is made mm -hmm. so i was wondering mm -hmm. is there are there any changes now whenever you put in your your request for say cp7 as yeah. to how the orr will award funds to network rail and then help to drive yeah. a change in behavior yeah yeah you're told yes you're absolutely right i think the this the silos that we we talk about are are created because of funding constraints and restrictions they're 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 forced that's forcing us to do that um so under under the cp7 um submission there are there are three categories for drainage you've got track drainage earthworks drainage and drainage resilience there is actually a pot there to allow for i i, I laugh and say it's for drainage drainage um, to allow us to look at those those pieces that need to be put in together to allow us to blend it together. Some of the some of the regions now who have um, root asset managers for drainage specifically are saying actually they manage all the drainage across the board and track and earthworks work with and structures work with that ram that ram drainage community to sponsor and make sure that the, the right forms and the designs are put together, output specifications are put together so that it's looked at as a system. Um, there's still more work to do. It's it's not, and I wish I could say that CP7 would, would switch and we'd have a change there. We won't. Um, we will have more funding in CP7 than we, she shouldn't jinx it. We've been told and promised that we will have more funding in CP7 than we had in CP6, which is um, different than other asset groups. And that is because it's been recognized how much more we need to do to sort our drainage out. And that's across the board for for track and earthworks, etc. So, so we are looking at that. And to me, to me, the way that I can help, even if we still keep pockets of money in different areas, is to provide that view of drainage as a system. So at least we're aware and saying, well, I'm only doing this part, but actually it's going to make no difference. I need to do this other part down here. We're at least aware and can make a conscious decision about what we, how we're spending that money and what we're expecting to get out of it as far as drainage performance. So that's that's kind of where we're at in that space at the moment. Um, and our asset policies and asset strategy and a um, our whole life cost modeling, all of these things are now coming live. So so the, the tools will be there. I just need the people to bring them all together. <laughs> okay, thanks Mona, thank you. No, my pleasure, Joan, nice to see you. And you. Okay, thank you. Um, Colin Cotter is next with a question. Hi, Mona. Um, Hi, Colin. Thanks for the talk. Um, that was very, very, very enlightening. Um, but you made a, a reference to wet buildings and steam yeah. coming out and so on. I didn't yeah. know if you were going to follow up with that one. Uh, what was that about? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, so the, I was referring to Goddington. Uh, we had a, um, uh, a an inspector who was going to inspect electrical building. There was steam coming out of the building. Unfortunately, he was then burnt very badly upon entering that building. 
So there's a lot of questions asked, of course, about why you would do certain things, um, you know, but mm. there was water in an electrical building that was creating enough heat to create steam. Um, since then, since then, the head of buildings um, and architecture has a tracker of what he calls wet buildings. And these are electrical line side buildings. Uh, I'm using buildings in a, a you know, substations, uh, location yeah. boxes, et cetera, where based on our inspections, they have been seen as either water is seeping through into these electrical buildings or their their water is seeping up because they're in they're in wet ground. And that's what's wet, that's what we're referring to as line side wet buildings. Right. And do they do they have who's actually responsible for trying to drain those wet buildings yes yes and it's is it and and in this in this pace as well this is well that's a really good question who who indeed if only we'd known before where we, these wet locations where we could build around it so each asset group um, would be working on those as well if if the wet building is about sealing it so it's more watertight that's that's the whoever owns those be that signaling or elect or emp or plant it would be about sealing it if you're talking about lifting up and rising it that is also would be sponsored by the electrification team but the drainage team would be able to support especially if you're looking into building suds sustainable urban drainage systems where you have to the requirement is to hold as much of the water on your land but you hold it in a way that you control it and then and then it slowly seeps into the ground so it's re recharging the groundwater sources that's where that legislation has come back come from it's not sorry it's not legislation but we think it should be legislation in the water industry suds mm. is about not just flushing the water quickly away but holding it in your ground in your in your land everybody mm. even homeowners everybody holding the water on your land and then that allows that water to soak slowly into the ground which then refills your ground your groundwater sources which are which we're depleting we're depleting those because um, yeah. we're pumping water out so but but the question about the asset management is is with the asset owner and and water like i said water will win so every asset owner needs to consider yeah. the impact of water on their asset and if it's about taking water away we're here in drainage to help collect and convey that water away okay thank you very much welcome thanks colin uh next up is ravi are you there Hi, uh, hi, Mona. It's a very good Hello. presentation. Thank you. It's a very fantastic. I, I really got a very beautiful insights of this track drainage systems. Previously, I don't have this understanding of the track drainage because um, all, all, all the experience I had is about the tunnel drainages. Mm. Then uh, I've been working in Singapore before. So there the practice is just the tunnel drainages connects into the, into the stormwater drainage system. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. recently, uh, the things unfolded, and then uh, there is a re regulation in place, mm -hmm. uh, which where we don't, uh, we're not allowed to dump that water from the uh, tunnel drainage system due to that uh, uh, act. So, uh, is there any such kind of practices happening in in UK? Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, Ravi, are we recording? Oh dear. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So then, then there, I'll connect you through LinkedIn yeah, so we can discuss yeah. about it. No, no, so no, no, just no. Curious. no, no. I'll be honest. No, no, no. We. It's about being honest. So there. Uh, yes, there is legislation around environmental legislation. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Around the water that leaves our discharge. So as as a riparian owner, we you all, if you own a home, you are if you are a landowner you have riparian owner accountabilities, which means that the water that leaves your land, that yeah. discharges from your land, you are responsible for that water, especially if it's full of pollutants, heavy metals, other yes. things that shouldn't yes. be in there, and you can be fined for that. Now, that's we understand that as a homeowner, and I have to be really frank, I don't think that Network Rail understand that as a railway. We are the fourth largest landowner in the UK. So who is the riparian owner for the railway? Is it, is it Mr. Andrew Haynes? 
is it the directors of engineering asset management? Who 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 is it? And when I ask that question and we start talking about that, no no one really knows. So um, myself and with the chief engineer are currently drafting a water management strategy that will help with the, with specifically understanding who is accountable and responsible. Your oh. question around discharges, yes, there are there we are supposed to have consents to discharge into natural water courses. Uh, we are supposed to have calculations of the hydrology and the water flow through our culverts so that we make sure, for example, um, that fish migration are not impacted by the culverts that we put in when we're especially for reducing the sizes of those culverts or changing the hydro hydraulic flow. It was it was a brick one. Now it's a it's a UV lined one. So you're changing the flow that could impact on fish migration, for example. Um, so we are supposed to work very closely with the environment agency um, and the sorry, and our environmental teams to make sure that we have the correct consents and we have the correct permits. Um, and that uh, also when there is flooding and we need to go on to third party land to address flooding, we need to have um, flood permits. Um, and we have been rejected when the railways flooded on other land because those permits were not in place. Um, and you can't just put in the section 17. There is also other changes in legislation around water abstraction. So that's the pumping of water out of the ground and using bo bottling it and using it or getting rid of it. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there's changes in legislation there. And very recently there's changes in legislation around sewage discharge into um, drainage, into water, into the, and then that eventually makes its way to the rivers. So you think, well, who actually does that affect the railway? If you think about our rolling stock, it absolutely does affect the railway. And so our rolling stock and train operating companies need to look at the uh, toilet flushing onto the railway. Oh, God, just, just, such a sexy area I work in, isn't it? Um, but but it's it's about putting in it's about putting in um, inception and receptic, uh, receptacle tanks or treatment. Uh, it, we could use the green space about using reeds to filter out materials. It's uh, it's at first knowing where the problem are. So at the moment, all of the railway is is classified by the environment agency as highly contaminated, and. Yeah that that means something now we can test the water that leaves the outfall and if we provide that independent testing of the water that leaves the outfall and it is clean and clear the ea has said they're absolutely happy to declassify that section to being not highly contaminated but um the question is have we ever tested the water that leaves our outfalls our discharge points we haven't yeah. And, okay. and when I mentioned we should do it, a lot of people got really nervous. Said, no, I don't think we want to know. Yeah, that's a huge expense. Eh? Well, it's probably not a huge expense. I could get university to do it for, as a researcher. Oh. <laughs> but well. it's when you know, now when you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank thanks you. Question. Thanks for the thanks for yeah. clarification. I have one more question, if the time permits. Uh, so you said the drainage system should be seen as a whole system mm -hmm. for the whole mm -hmm. network. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uh, maybe the the maintenance regimes to get into that kind of mindset might take a, a little bit of time. Yeah. So meanwhile, uh, for those uh, sections where we are doing it as a segment, okay. So is there any tip that uh, or any 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 suggestion that you would give to uh, just keep it to mm -hmm. any suggestion that we can approach as a whole system? Um, so, so interesting at enough, moment. at the moment, yeah, rotting and jetting is our most most productive, fastest way of maintaining at least the track drainage system. You can get lots of productivity through with rotting and jetting, and our 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 um, drainage RRV vehicles that can come on and do that activity as well. The challenge, you're absolutely right, is in the earthwork side where vegetation has overgrown the the yeah. crest drain, the unlined ditches. The channels that are there, and to say to our maintenance teams, you've got to climb up a slope or go onto third-party land to get to there to then uh, reprofile the ditch, is is difficult. It is a challenge. It is very much a challenge. So so we are looking. We're, we're trying to be radical, actually, in in thinking. You know, do we need to have catch pits and pipes? Can we not have wicking material or fit or fin drains? 
that we put in the set so that you've got actually all you need is a lovely cross fall as long as the water leaves and gets to the edges we could take it away why are we putting in pipes and pits surely there's new innovative material construction methods that would allow us to wick that material away from the track so you're keeping the track strong and dry and get that water to the edges um, so we need to start to think radical and differently to to what we currently do because it's it's difficult and it's going to be more and more challenging to maintain uh, th those type, those types of components thank you thank you mona mm -hmm. thank you um we're running short on time but there are two more questions so <laughs> Okay. Should be okay Sorry. to <laughs> I'm... take them. Uh, so mm -hmm. Tony uh, Mogani has a question. Yeah, cheers, Leon. Hiya, Mona. Hiya, Tony. Hiya. Um, yeah, my question, and I don't know how easy it's going to be to answer, uh, I was just wondering if there's anything to your knowledge being done within Network Rail to sort of improve coordination between the functions um, mm. in, in terms of not, not so much funding that you've already touched on, but but where things have already got funding and they've gone to a planning stage. Um, I work for a principal contractor that does deliver a lot of drainage and we often will run up against um, issues trying to get access because there's a track renewal going on in there. Yeah. So we're waiting for the track renewal to go on. They'll put in an all nice new fresh ballast and everything on top of failed drainage <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, and yep. then we'll come in and get it all back out, you know, yep. just sort of coordinating yep. those activities a bit better, making better yep. use of the money, a bit more sustainable. Yep. Yeah, no, Tony, and, and it's the other way around as well, where we put our lovely new, lovely shiny new drainage in, and then and then the truck yeah. renewal happens. Uh, I I've been out on a lot of truck renewal sites and stood there during the excavation works and seen the pipes being excavated out and dug up, and you know you think, oh God, who cares? Who, yeah, it's not it's not good. Um, so so there um, it's it's. It's an education piece, Tony. I think to for for me to sort of take on. There, there's still. I'm not trying to take money away from track. I really am not. Um, but however, what we're doing is we are literally throwing money down the drain when we don't build when we don't have functioning drainage performance and we put in a formation renewal. Um, I recall back there was a, a when I was in track renewals in in the track uh, working with Peter Musgrave back then. Um, there was a study saying we were doing renewals on West Coast Main Line that should have lasted for 25 years. Formation renewal, new ba rail, ballast rail sleepers, every you know the lot, geotextile yeah. material, sand blanket, and they should have lasted for 25 years, and they were failing after seven. And we were back doing a formation renewal again after seven years, and then we we do that, and then we were back again. And well, you got to stop and ask why. Why is this failing? What is it going on? And then when you look, you're like, well, the drainage is destroyed. There's no, there's, we're not draining to the, wa the water away. When we look at wet beds and repeat wet beds coming up over and over again, and we're replacing, oh, we got a wet bed, take it out. Oh, another wet bed, take it out. Another wet bed. Stop, stop. Why do we have wet beds? What's causing it? We'll ask the five whys. Why, why, why? Sort that out, and then you'll save money later. So um, I'm, funnily enough, I'm meeting with someone next week who did a piece of work for for Wessex that looked at a one pound investment in drainage was a savings of three pounds in track because you were building that that flowing drainage, you were getting the water away. Um, and so then when you do, when you've got that and you do a renewal, it's gonna stay and it's gonna last and it's gonna be a whole longer whole life cost rather than it, this, this, this hamster wheel we seem to be on so yeah. i've got a lot to do in educating um and getting an awareness out there that water is is causing us more problems than than we than we realize and we need to start saying why is this happening why 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 and and get to the real root cause and fix that definitely um, yeah good luck with that yeah thanks tony <laughs> <laughs> you help me <laughs> you say too <laughs> So I think we've got just enough time for the last question. Um, back, okay. back to Richard Hill. How are you doing? Uh, thanks again, Mona, for taking the last question. It was sure. you're talking about climate events, and mm -hmm. we look at the modelling of what the storms come through, and mm -hmm. obviously we design drainage to a certain capacity. Have mm -hmm. the one in one hundred storms, or one in one thousand storms, or one in ten storms figures actually been amended? Because we're now seeing more extremes of climate yeah. more frequently. Yeah. So has that actually 
that changed the design parameters of what we should be designing for yeah yeah yes it, yes it has a, a little bit so in this in the drainage design standard it still says you for your primary routes you're doing a one in 50 and then yeah. for your for your secondary routes you're doing a one in 25 and i remember up uh, umming and awing saying should we do a one in 100 and one and it was like oh god it's gonna cost us you know which is going to break the bank so in the drainage design standard what it says is that a designer should design for the one in 25 or one in 50 depending on the route but yeah. the drainage designer should then also look at a one in 200 event one in a 500 event and based on what was modeled from that what would be the impact of that on the railway and present that information then if it was like oh nothing don't worry about it if you could have a one in 200 event don't worry it'll it'll soak away or it'll it'll go away don't worry about it okay fine but if you're on a, on a main line and you're going to say god a one in 200 event is absolutely going to knock this all out it's just going to be really horrible um and you're talking about major flooding that's going to be you know your drainage system is just going to be nothing um then the ram or the sponsor of that product of that drainage design can make an educated judgment at that point to say fine let's put in a more resilient system let's go to one in a hundred um and that doesn't double your cost from from building a one in 50 um drainage system to building a one in a hundred drainage system isn't simply double it's it's actually um when when looking at it you you're not paying all you're, you're paying for a deeper excavation and a wider excavation and a bigger pipe however if you look at the cost of that to the overall cost of the whole project, your mobilization, your possessions, your design, your construction, um, all of that, that, that increase is not much more, it's not gonna break your bank. Um, so the smallest uh, and I cost need... can have the biggest impact then, really. So the, the smallest cost you've got can have the biggest impact yeah, to give you the best that... resilience. It, so yeah. all the upfront costs you face, if yeah. you take a little yeah. bit more pain in the upfront, you could save a fortune down the, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Spending pennies, absolutely. saving pounds, yeah. It, it, it's, it's exactly that, it's exactly yeah. that. And you could be yeah. reactive or you could be proactive, but trust me, yeah. climate change, extreme and adverse weather, being reactive, as we had even with these high winds, it's very nerve wracking, isn't it? <laughs> it's not It's yeah. not a comfortable position to be in, but yeah. Okay. Uh, great, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we have run a few minutes over, but I think it was worth it. Um, I'm not going to say much apart from to say thank you very much, Mona, for your presentation. Um, we've all learned a lot. I think the quantity and quality of questions and, and your responses sort of says everything about the presentation. Pleasure. Oh, pleasure. Like, invite everyone to turn on their cameras and microphones, and if we could give a, a round of applause to, to thank Mona for your presentation. Oh, bless. <laughs> And it's nice to see. Oh, I've got little ones as well. Go. We've got little ones as well. Hey, <laughs> thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Chris, it's lovely to see you as well, Mr. Preston. Hi, Mona. Good. Hi, good Chris. Hi, yeah. Very interesting talk. Thanks. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. So it's lovely to see lots of familiar faces as well. Thank you for having me, Liam. Thank you very much for giving up your time to present to us. Thank you. Thank you. Great talk, Mona. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Mona. Name I haven't heard for a while as well. That's uh... <laughs> Great. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Liam, do you need me to stay on or is there any sort of post presentation brief or? Um... No, uh, people, nope. some people generally hang around for five, 10 minutes, but it's entirely no worries. up to you. No worries. I've given the slides to Sarah, so uh, feel free to, she's, she 